Hello, Tendies, Friendies. Welcome back to Tendies Club. Got a great show for you. These banks, these prime brokers are making most of their money, most of their money from shorting, most of their money from creating shares that don't exist and charging extremely high uh, rates as if they were creating these, as if they were actually having these shares and delivering them, which they're not. So we'll check that out and we'll see how they're doing their stuff in the international uh, international. Uh, black box that, that is uh, the international markets outside the purview of the SEC. We'll check that out from, from all this is from Lucy Komisar, who's coming to join us tomorrow. I'll send an invitation for that later. I even have to check the time myself, but I've been reviewing all of her material. So much stuff, so much amazing stuff. Uh, let's check, uh, we're going to check a ton of it out and, uh, and we're going to see some very, very cool, very serious stuff. We'll check that out. Uh, before we before we get, I'm not an investment advisor. This is not investment advice. I'm not a tax advisor. This is not tax advice. I need to move my microphone for this dance. This is Tendi's Club. Uh, please chat and comment. And uh, uh, you know what's going on with the stock right now. I didn't look at the stock yet, I guess, in the pre-market. But uh, what, what that I saw last night, it was, it was you know having some troubles, whatever. Uh, but that's what they're doing right now to the stock is they're just creating shares. We'll see how they're doing it. We'll see how they're doing it. We'll see how they're doing it. It's a bunch of, bunch of, bunch of, bunch of nonsense. And uh, so we'll take a look at how they're doing it. Please chat, please comment, please subscribe, please share, please get the alerts, and uh, please like, 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 and like the liking. Really like the liking. I like the liking. Like the liking. Let's go. Let's go. All right, so here's Lucy Comisar coming to join us tomorrow. I think it might be tomorrow at noon. I think we were doing noon when, I, when, we, when we confirmed this invitation. So it's tomorrow at noon, I believe. So uh, here we're going to hear about the international stuff. So this is a story she's going to begin with about, let me move myself off of Lucy's face here. Uh, this is a story we, uh, about uh, in how they had international stuff. So we'll begin with, with a story about the international stuff, and then uh, we'll see that that goes into the prime brokers. They have the inter their international divisions, and then we'll get into the prime brokers and Citadel being the big Citadel and the Kramer types being the two big enemies. Uh, we're going to hear from a hedge fund. Uh, she interviews a hedge fund manager who originally was shorting uh, Overstock. This is uh, this is interesting. I'm going to going to talk to the talk to the class. Uh, this, this hedge fund manager Mark Cahodes was originally shorting Overstock. And uh, and Patrick Byrne sued him, and oh, the Overstock CEO Patrick Byrne, who founded T Zero as well, and who did that preferred dividend, which went from made the stock go from like three to a hundred and something, made forty x brilliant stuff, which we have to do. They're creating phantom shares right now. Uh, but I digress. So Mark Mark Cahodes was a hedge fund manager shorting Overstock, and Patrick Byrne sued him, and uh, Patrick Byrne talked to him, and and Mark Cahodes said, "Look, I'm not your problem." You want to? It's the prime brokers. They're they're uh, they're creating these phantom shares, and eventually uh, the head, this hedge fund manager Patrick Byrne became buddies, and so that's kind of an interesting story. We'll check that. We'll check that out. But uh, uh, so anyway, so that uh, we'll, so we'll get into. Uh, we'll hear from Mark Cahodes, very interesting, and then we'll hear from uh, a former, a, a, I think a, a former former some administration official who's on our side. And who uh, who is very who's optimistic about Gary Gensler, and he doesn't have his eyes. He's not blinded. He's he's uh. So we'll we'll, have, we'll hear from him as well. So Mark Robert Shapiro, I think his name is. So uh, just some excellent detective work from uh, Lucy Komisar. Uh, so let's hear from Lucy. Is in New York to collaborate with Fasinkovich. and uh, so there was Bodian, uh, who was about thirty, and his brother Andreas was twenty six, and uh, they were introduced as in investment advisors for clients who would go through Vasinkovich and they would run naked short selling scams connected to offshore shell companies. Everything went through offshore, um, the British Virgin Islands, Panama, Zurich, Liechtenstein, all of that. Now I understand Mark Valentine had 2000 offshore accounts and he would use them as a shell game so that if he was forced to buy in on something, he would then just magically produce a million counterfeit shares from another offshore company. And so it's a constantly rotating shell game. So why offshore? So it's, they were investment advisors. So they're supposed to be getting investors and they're introduced to um, the people from Sedona, which is- Okay, so I'm gonna stop that. Then, then we get into the international uh, aspect of the prime brokers. So it's these market makers, as we know, and Citadel, where do you see Citadel and just how, uh, 
So we're going to see how evil Goldman and the like are. And then Citadel is just so much more powerful these days and so much larger. These uh, big brokers and hedge funds all have uh, subsidiaries in many, many countries, especially the banks have subsidiaries in many and a lot of offshore subsidiaries. So you don't really know what's going on there, where they are moving shares, uh, where how they're dealing. But, but sorry, I want to stick with so, has there, so it's Citadel that's it's making all these profits. But how profitable is it? But with these big banks like Goldman Sachs, and it, it stands to reason like like uh, Merrill Lynch, Bank of America, J.P. Morgan, uh, uh, Morgan Stanley, uh, Deutsche, all the big market makers, all the big prime brokers that they're doing this, and it, it, because it's so lucrative, it's organized crime. They're just stealing. It, it's really terrible. And Marco Hodes, I really like Marco Hodes because he's he's mad about it, and he's he he's uh, he's doing something about it. And so is West Christian. The one nice thing about how awful this is, it seems to be getting people motivated. I know I am. So, so anyway, she's she's getting into uh, how the the prime brokers are use are they're using international to hide uh, all the all their crimes the, of of creating these shares for the shorting. So this is the, and then we're going to hear just how lucrative it is. Dealing with the loans, you know, the loans, the stock loans, it's the major part. People don't know this. It's the major part of the profits of the big, uh, the prime brokers. I've seen the number 75%. It's massive, massive. Yeah, hang on, so hang, on hang on, hang on, that. hang on. Let me just, let me just correct, like make sure I've got this right. You're saying that 75% of the profits of big, uh, big institutions in some cases come simply from loaning shares out that are on their books. This was from uh, uh, investigation, the um, discovery in, uh, Goldman Sachs, uh, the case, the overstock case against Goldman and Merrill. And I talked to uh, one of the uh, investigators who had worked with Patrick Byrne on, on this case. Uh, and he said they were astonished. He said, I thought, you know, must be a big number. This may be 20 percent. In discovery, he said, we were astonished to find that they were getting 75 percent of their profits from uh, stock loans. Now, two things about that. One is, uh, and there have there have been cases on this. In some cases, they have made loans to uh, to to uh, brokers or to to clients um, to brokers on behalf of clients who were shorting and needed shares to cover the short, and they never sent any share. They p charge them, uh, and sometimes for hard to borrow, like Overstock, you can go to fifty percent of the cost of the share. That it was very, very high. And that's the key. So they're making all this money loaning stocks, creating shares that don't exist. We'll, do, we'll see how they do it in the options and hiding. We just saw it internationally. We don't really know what they're doing internationally. But we'll see how they do it with options to create phantom shares, these, these prime brokers, and then and then let people short. But they're, so they're making all this. So it turns out it's like it's most of their profits are from doing this. But it's not from, we're going to see, it's not from. Uh, loaning out uh, like the, the big, oh, sometimes people want to short uh, Pepsi Cola or whatever. No, it's these hard to borrow ones where it, they cost, they, it's like 50% charges uh, per year, uh, and which is extremely high. And so when it's the hard to borrow, well, the cassava is hard to borrow. And so that, so then the people that want to short it and the, the, uh, the, that have their agenda to short it, they'll, they'll, there's just a fee they pay. And where do you see the fee they pay? Mark Cahodes, who used to do this, talks about the fee he paid. Where do you see what he paid? Because we speculated about this. Well, why are the prime brokers doing this? Why are they letting them fail? Why are they creating these phantom shares for the hedge funds? Well, because they're, they're getting a kickback, I guess. Well, where do you see the kickback? Where do you see the kickback? It's a humongous kickback. They're just doing it. They're just, it, it's a fee. If you want to short a hard to borrow stock, you can you can create phantom shares, which is totally it's, it's illegal. It's totally illegal, and they just they but they'll do it for a fee. They'll, and then they'll hide it internationally, and they'll uh, they'll do it through X clearing as well, which is a whole other part I didn't have time to include, but aggravating. Hi, uh, and they sorry. What now? Let's move on to Mark Cahodes. So this guy, I love, we're going to hear a lot of this guy. This is this is we're going to hear some lengthy stuff. Going to prison a week from today. So he, uh, he, he <laughs> I, this guy, uh, he, he goes after his enemies. Goldman stole a lot of money from him uh, and, uh, and he goes after his enemies. Well, let so me ask you a, sp a specific, getting back to what Kramer said, you and Rocker Partners were sued in 2005 on just- They just watched that, sh that stuff on Kramer. 
he hates Kramer. So the people like Kramer are the enemies, the ones creating the fake reality provide cover. And then the, the, the just organized crime of, of Citadel these days, just robbing people blind. And they, that kind of, as he says, they provide nothing. They don't provide anything. Charged by Patrick Byrne, who is the CEO of Overstock. He said on August 8th, 2005, I bought 25,000 shares of OSTK, that's Overstock. My broker was unable to settle the trade and said, Morgan Stanley refused to deliver with, with statements to the effect that you have to understand this is a very hot stock. By hot, apparently they mean, uh, Byrne said, a stock in which cheating is being allowed. And he said 50 days after the trade, Morgan Stanley finally delivered. Now, four days after the fail to deliver, he files suit against Gradient Analytics, Rocker Partners, David Rocker, and you. He said Rocker Partners work with Gradient, a research firm, to manipulate overstock shares. He said journalists were involved, and the whole scheme was being orchestrated by a master criminal he called the Sith Lord, but declined to identify. Was the charge true? Now, people in the Kramer video if Kramer did that when he was at a hedge fund, it's patently illegal. But that's up to the SEC and the DOJ to do their job. I'm not a law enforcement guy. I don't, I don't prosecute people. I can give tips to the government and they're gonna go about doing that stuff. But that video about Kramer is absolutely disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. And if it goes on, those people should be banned from the business. And how Kramer has a job at CNBC after that kind of that kind of hysterical thing is beyond me. It's not us with the can't borrow the shares. It's not. So now he's talking about. So uh, now he's talking about uh, how Patrick Byrne originally sued him, and he said he's saying to Patrick Byrne, "Listen, you sh we're not your enemy. We shouldn't be allowed to do. Uh, we're just we're just going to short, and they're." Uh, they're letting us, so we're not doing anything wrong. It's the prime brokers. It's Goldman in this case. Now it's Citadel. Not us, because we're being charged to borrow the shares, and we can't short the stock unless we borrow the shares. We cannot short them, Patrick, unless we can borrow them. You should take your issues to the prime brokers. It had everything to do with, with Burns' view and he was right about the naked shorting and naked shorting was not enforced back in that period. The rules changed 2008, 2009 ish. And this was in the 2004, five period. Rules were very different back then and rules changed. But Byrne at least had the common sense to listen to me. And instead of going for the hedge funds, he went after the prime brokers. He went after the prime brokers and he sued Goldman and Merrill and Morgan and all these guys. And it was basically because I told him what was really going on. Mm -hmm. So, so he, he filed a suit, just as you said, in 2007 against Goldman and 11 other prime brokers alleging <laughs> massive illegal stock market manipulation. The case would go on for eight years, wasn't settled till uh, 2015, and you would play an important role in it, giving testimony in uh, 2011. So let's look at your connection, talk about your connection to Goldman. You have said your fund had paid Goldman $100 million over the years to borrow shares. Uh, why did Copper River rely on Goldman to handle short sales, including Overstock, rather than perhaps some other broker? Well, those are really good questions. You have your numbers wrong. We didn't pay Goldman 100 million over the years. We paid Goldman 100 million a year. 100 million a year. This is just one hedge fund. They were paying 100 million a year as a fee to create shares so they could so the, the, your, your share count is whatever I say it is for a fee. That's all it is. We can, we can create as many shares, which is illegal. You can't do that. Uh, In some okay. years, to borrow the shares, okay? And it used to be, it used to be in the real world that people's words were good and that people would not actually knowingly break the law for money to enable you to do your business. All Goldman had to say to us at any point in time is, we can't borrow those shares. They synthetically created shares. They didn't have the shares borrowed in retrospect and they charged us huge fees. We paid huge fees 
for a service that was never provided. And when the government changed the rule. All right, and then, so huge fees, 100 million a year for a service that was never provided. 100 million a year, they're, they're simply, and I think he's gonna talk now about the options, about how are they doing this. They simply look at what it costs to synthetically create uh, the, these shares in the options market, and then they charge them uh, more. And that's it. And then, and then, so there's but they can't, they're, and then, and they, they're supposedly, there's a, a share that's actually being shorted, delivered. You well, have paid them. That's, and what, what makes you think that that's the case? Well, I know, I know it's the case. How? I know, I know it's the case because post fact, after I did the deposition for Overstock and Goldman and Byrne, you know, prevailed eventually he sent my lawyer uh information and emails from goldman where were specifically mentioned where they admit they didn't have the shares borrowed they 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 admit to everything which is why overstock ended up prevailing against goldman they they admitted to not having the shares borrowed and we were mentioned by name in well in the time of 08, when Goldman was doing this to you. Um, okay. Then I think maybe now he talks about the options. I'm not sure. He talks about a bunch of stuff. So whoever is out there watching this or whoever. Okay. So parental advisor here, this guy talked explicit language. This guy uses a, I know there's some kids that watch the show, which I think is so awesome. <laughs> uh, but this guy uses some foul language which we don't, we don't condone, but this is an important message. So this is, this is an important message. For listens to what, whoever is out there watching this or whoever listens to what I have to say, listen to this carefully. Your brokerage firm does not give a rat's fucking ass about you. Robin Hood could care less about you. None of these brokerage firms could care about you. They've all paid significant fines. Citadel's paid huge fines. Robin Hood's paid fines. All these guys have paid fines. And it's basically like paying a speeding ticket. They just don't care. They don't care. They don't make changes. They don't give a rat's ass about you. So when we did this deposition, if you will, I couldn't stand Goldman. I couldn't stand Overstock. My lawyer, Shapiro, who was with me at the deposition, told the Goldman lawyer, do not ask Mark about Goldman and what Goldman did with the firm. Stay away from that because that is red meat in front of a Jaguar. And sure enough, the lawyer did. And I just lit into him and I went over exactly how Goldman does business. And and. You know, these conversions, if you will, are or and or should be illegal but there's a little loophole in in this that i'll get into later and basically if goldman and or market makers market makers in in stocks and in options can be short the stock without a borrow they can short you stock without them borrowing it and they sell calls they sell deep in the money calls for a premium and they buy deep in the money puts and they sh they then sell you the fake or created shares where there's no borrow and you have the shares and when the borrow gets pulled or bought in they simply reverse that trade let's say for june and roll it to july and then when the issue happens in july they roll july into august so they keep rolling this trade as long as the customer wants it without ever having to deliver the shares now there's a loophole that says market makers do not need to borrow shares to keep in quotes air quote a fair and orderly market and this is where the so-called naked shorting or shorting without a borrow comes from Citadel, if they're a market maker in this day and age, can be short all the pick the name you want <clears throat> and they don't need to borrow and they don't need to pay the borrow fees because if asked, they're maintaining a fair and orderly market. So market makers can legally, and this is the irony of this whole thing, can legally 
be naked short of stock without a borrow because that is the law and that is the rule. Now, if people want to change the rule, that's a whole different thing. But everyone who's complaining about naked shorting in this day and age, whether it's GME or AMC or things like that, you need to look no further than the market makers. See, back, back before the SEC changed the rule in 2008, 2009, whenever they were doing it, and, and prior to then, you could do these option conversions and they weren't viewed per se as, as illegal or as illegal as, as a customer would look at it. So this is very technical stuff. This is done by the higher ups and computers and people who run these numbers. And, and the citadels of the world who make markets in options and who do this kind of stuff, they're not breaking the law per se. They're not because they'll say they're maintaining a fair and orderly market. <clears throat> but one, they're making an absolute fortune doing this. Two, they don't have to pay the huge negative rebate, re, uh, rebate fee that individuals or institutions pay for. And these guys are the true enemy, along with the Kramer types who, who do what he did in the video you showed. So there's a lot, there's a huge misunderstanding out there about what really goes on. I mean, what really and truly goes on and how it goes on. And it's dirty as hell and, and, and it needs to stop. But I All right. So how, that's a ton of stuff. We're going to hear some more. just want to speak as it relates to me and what I know. Yes. Yes. So Goldman is in the business of making money for Goldman. Robin Hood's in the business of making money for Robin Hood and Citadel's in the business of making money for Ken Griffin, right? Goldman can loan out Procter and Gamble. Goldman can loan out Philip Morris. Goldman can loan out IBM and they make two or three basis points. They make next to nothing. In stocks that are in quote, hard to borrow or in demand to borrow, the rates can go anywhere from 3% to 100%. And, and depending on Goldman's cost of creating the share, that's not counterfeiting, that's creating the shares, creating. They figure out what it costs for them to create it in options, puts and calls, hmm. to create the shares to loan them to me. If it costs them 30% annually, they then go and charge me 45. So they make 15% on something that basically they didn't have to even pay me. So they make 40, they'd make 15%, but I would never get the share. I'm paying them 45 assuming I have legitimate shares, right? I'm paying them 45, assuming that they're paying you 42 to lend me the shares, right? Mm -hmm. Legitimately doing it. Because if I knew what was going on, I would have never have done it. No one in their right mind would have ever done it. I didn't know that. And the reason I know it is Burns lawyers sent my lawyers internal emails from Goldman that came out in discovery where Goldman admitted to what they were doing, admitted to how they figured out the numbers, admitted that this was, was what they were doing. So when the government pulls out the rug from under Goldman and said, you have to settle in three days, Goldman says, we're either going to choke on it or we might as well put Cahotas and crew out of business or put them in such a way where they can't fight back. So they cost them nine figures. They, they, they basically, Goldman basically, basically the idea there is they steal from their own clients. He was a client of Goldman's. And when times got tough in the financial crisis, uh, they, they intentionally uh, tried to make, did, do everything to make him fail. What, what he's saying, all my money at my other brokerages, and my money, the, the, my money at other places, we were up like 100%, it's like our best year. But here, like Goldman intentionally kept working against us to make us fail. And so they cost him like nine figures. He hates Goldman Sachs. So we're going to talk, but really they're just, they're just not nearly as big anywhere near. They got basically destroyed. 
and they're not nearly as big as uh, Citadel now. So we'll check that out. But as Wayne points out, Saba is ripping, I guess, which I really hope, but I guess the market's not open. Let's see when the pre-market are they up. Oh, so we were ripping. I don't know. But whatever's happened in the pre-market, whatever. Let's go back to, and so now we're going to see So now we're going to see more about Citadel. Uh, Citadel is just <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, they're, they're, they, are the, they are the next financial crisis. Citadel is the next financial crisis. Basically, GameStop was the next financial cri crisis. They, they got so, so screwed that they had to screw the retail people and say, no one can buy, you can only sell. Or no one can sell. Yeah, no one can buy, you can only sell. Because otherwise, <laughs> Citadel would, would have uh, collapsed and the whole economy would have collapsed. Goldman now has had their regulatory head kicked in. Mm -hmm. Goldman used to be thought of as a premium place. It's not thought of as a premium place anymore. It's thought about it as just kind of a bunch of greedy scumbags trying to rip people off. And the, the company, which used to be a pristine image place, now trades at a very, very, very low multiple. So Goldman's basically had their heads kicked in. They're very highly regulated and, and sort of the cat's out of the box between that M1DB or whatever they call it and all their, their chicanery and all the bullshit they've done. People are sort of onto it. And, and Goldman 2.0 or really 3.0 is Citadel. I mean, Citadel right now is... 32 times more dangerous than Goldman ever was mm. because A, he's so leveraged. This is Griffin. And he's a genius, by the way. He is not a dope. He knows exactly what he's doing. He is hugely leveraged. He's tied into every part of the market. He's in hedge fund. He's in trading. He's in market making. He's in ARB. He's in pay for flow. He's in every, he has he has every single table at the casino and the eye in the sky and the bank covered. He is on every part of every trade, this guy. And, and he's hired former government lawyers, officials. He has Bernanke. He used to pay Janet Yellen. He's got everybody. So he has this thing tied and wired soup to nuts. You so, said you see all the sides of the trades. This is like a poker game and somebody's going around and looking at all the cards. How can that be legal if you're seeing both sides of the trades? So Lucy, as I've said before, I am not a lawyer. I am not a regulator. I do not set the law. I do not, I cannot enforce the law. I can just speak my mind. He has all sides of all trades in the names. He has all sides. That is not a debate. And that includes this the, the biggest scam going, which is this payment for order flow. Now, there's experts on payment for flow and there's experts on options. There's experts on market making. There's experts on all this stuff, right? I'm not an expert on any of it. I know a lot about all of it. And, and, I, can, and I can help guide whoever needs help through this. But what completely screws up the argument by the Wall Street bets and Reddit, and whatever crowd that has you is you get down these rabbit holes and you can get lost. You know, this whole argument about how many shares are in the float, you know, they keep changing this or they used extra boxed or extra fail, right? Griffin and Citadel want you to focus on that because it doesn't mean jack fucking shit to anybody. And they basically could say, who cares? What matters and what's key? And if you get in. Okay, so here we go. So this is, so that, that's important. So he's saying that there's a lot of like everybody, everybody's upset about this, but he's saying that there's the Citadel and everybody wants you to, that they sort of want the misdirection. So here's, he, so listen to this next portion here. what matters and what's key and if you get in, in those who are listening to this and i hope a lot of people do 
if you get nothing out of this, I want you to listen to what I'm about to say, okay? When Robin Hood and the long haired guy who runs it, what's his name? That, Vlad? The greasy guy, yeah, Vlad. <laughs> When he was on the Cartoon Network, also known as CNBC that day, he said, you know, there's no margin call, everything's great, everything's wonderful, it's business as usual, everything's fine, right? To then find out hours later that Robin Hood had a, what, a $3 billion margin call? Something like that? They had a $2 billion, $3 billion something with DTCC where they needed to raise money on an urgent basis overnight through the VC guys, I think that's sort of the timeline. What everyone should ask themselves is, why did Citadel give Melvin money, right, mm -hmm. as a bailout? Because Melvin was about to go under. Why did Citadel give a billion or two billion or whatever they gave Melvin? Why didn't they just give it to Robinhood? Robinhood's their customer. Robinhood is their guy who they play the payment for flow game. If I'm, if you and I, right, are as tight as tight can be, and you have a $3 billion margin call, you call me up and say, hey, Mark, we do all this business. Can you loan me $3 billion for a week? Sure, Lucy. What's it going to cost you? I'll give you 10% of my firm, right? I'll give you 10% and I'll pay interest. I'll say, no problem. I'll wire that you'll have the money in 4.7 seconds as soon as I hit the return key, right? Why would Ken Griffin not have given Robin Hood money? Why did they give it to Melvin, who had the absolute wrong side of the trade as everyone from Robin Hood? Why? I've never, I've never heard anyone bring it up. I've never heard anyone ask the question. I would, I would like to get the greasy haired guy, Vlad, Griffin, Warren, Senator Warren, Gensler, head of the SEC, all in a room, all in the room, Melvin in the room, and I'll do the asking of the questions. I'll ask everyone the questions. I'll create the timeline, and everyone can sit there and take notes, and that way we can get to the truth. What would your answer be? Why, why, why did they do that? Why did they? Uh, because I, I, I think Citadel was so upside down in the GameStop, AMC, whatever, MEME stock trades that, that given their leverage, they would have gone under. They would have gone under had this Melvin thing gone another day or so. Because there's no reason that a sane person without lying could say, why would Robin Hood stop one side of the trades that day? Because what Robin Hood did was they completely and utterly destroyed their clients. They completely, when you close one side of the market, the other side of the market, the downside of the market is a huge winner. If you have all buyers and no sellers, stock goes through the roof. When you have all sellers and no buyers, the stock collapses. And in all my years, I'm 61 years old. I've been doing this since I was 16 years old. I've never, ever, ever seen unilaterally one side of a market closed. In a, in a normal period. Now, I've seen the markets closed for 9-11. I've seen markets closed on panics. I've seen markets closed on margin. I've seen I've seen markets markets closed for all sorts of reasons. They did, E-Trade did this to me with Tonix Pharmaceuticals. Tonix, one of my tattoos. Uh, they used to, E-Trade used to, uh, they, they, they would uh, only allow selling and uh, you'd have to f f call E-Trade to buy. And I, and I would call them and yell them like, what the heck? And uh, they'd say, oh yeah, it's on a list. It's like extra risky, we're, we're helping you. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. But so it was happened, it happened, happened to me before with the, these, with these with it, was, it was happening before this with the big, with Citadel, with the big uh, easy to see thing. I've never seen one side of a group of stocks closed for a period of time, given the incremental stress that was being built in. And all the excuses around it are nothing but lies, are nothing but lies. And all these guys do at the end of the day, you know, Robin Hood pays this fine. Citadel pays that fine. This guy pays this fine. It's nothing for them. It is lunch money. I mean, Ken Griffin is one of the richest guys in, in, in the country. So Citadel didn't need to give liquidity to the, the prime broker or, the, or to the, the for order flow, whatever. 
uh, to, to, the, to, the, to the brokerage, uh, they needed the one side of the trade to 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 stop losing so much because they were on it and they were there. So they just they just forced the mark. They just forced winners. They uh, they forced they forced the, the the side that was right to lose the retail side because they didn't have the, the power. They, that's this kind of control that they have, uh, Citadel. So which is why we need the blockchain because you just can't do that crap on the blockchain. So so good. So a couple of some good things about all this. What we're going is there's this is all aggravating stuff. But with the, they let let people get out over their skis and do this, and then issue that preferred share dividend, and it will it'll blow them up. There's there, that's that's why eventually Burns said I'm not going to get help through the through the system, uh, and so issue that issue that. Dividend. He doesn't bring any good to society. He doesn't help people eat. He doesn't produce anything for any good other than to feather him and his employees' pockets by ripping off others. Did Just, uh, did Citadel's behavior carry a financial risk to the market and to society? Yeah, I think I think in the next market collapse, and it could have happened in the prior market collapse in 08, Citadel, Citadel, every market collapse is the too big to fail guy. I mean, there I, I think Citadel is Bank of America's largest customer in the world. I'd love for it to see someone prove me wrong on that one. I think they're at least in the top three, but I think they're the largest. They, they do more business with the big banks and the government than anyone on the planet. And they're so big and they're too big to fail and no one wants to shake the apple cart that they just let it go on. And, and the irony is the people who get screwed every time through the test of time is who I call Joe Sixpack. Mm -hmm. the, the Robin Hood guys, the it'll be the Wall Street bet guys, people like that because they get done in by the people with the power, with the connections, with the clout, people who break the rules and laws, and they know they're not going to jail. They know they're not going to jail. They just pay a fine and they just keep on going. Now, another one of the, the big boys that was involved here was Steve Cohn, point 72. What, what role did he play? He and by the Cohn. way, uh, let's go back to the Sith Lord that uh, Patrick Byrne said, was involved in well, these are uh, all names involved in, 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 sovereign. We in be promoting and naked shorting his his company years ago and then i heard is that was steve Cohen the sith lord you said you found out about who it was mm -hmm. so first he asked me about sac we got to do this and you're asking me these compounded questions yes <laughs> i'm not a fan of his at mm -hmm. all um He's paid a billion dollars to the government for things he said he never did. He owns the New York Mets. I can't stand him. I can't stand how he operates, but he's he is what he is. And and maybe one day karma catches his number, but he is not. He is not. I am not a fan, not a fan, never been a fan. So as a postscript, Burn and I ended up becoming pals. And I ended up buying Overstock, and I still own a lot of Overstock, and the stock's done really well. And and to know Patrick, the most interesting person I've ever known, and I know some interesting people. He's a fascinating person. He is beyond. He is beyond brilliant. Show. Um, he suffers hugely from from. He's way out on the spectrum. He's socially uh, beyond awkward. Things like that. In the Sith Lord for the drum roll, mm -hmm. right? You can remember this one. The Sith Lord in Burns' eyes was Milken. Oh, okay. The Sith Lord in Burns' eyes was Michael Milken. Mm -hmm. That's who he thought the Sith Lord actually was. He thought it was Milken. He thought Stevie Cohn was a, a close number two and was part of it with the hedge fund world. But I told him I can't stand Stevie Cohn and those people who he put up on his chart most of them i can't stand i can't stand 90 percent of the people in the hedge fund business i think they're all uh beyond shady but burn thought the sith lord was none other than milken but you know the the thing is so if you're my enemy you can become my pal so he became my pal we're not so great right now but if you're my pal and you double cross me you're done for life you're you're done you're you're okay. absolutely what about Stevie Cohn and Point Seventy Two and and the <laughs> issue we're talking about with um, what what the Citadel was doing and uh, the well, I think I think he, I think he was involved in GME as well and Melvin, 
you know, the fund is run by a guy named Plotkin. And I have no problem with Plotkin. I've talked to him on the phone a couple of times. He's a nice guy. He, he has far more money than brains. Um, he's, he, he, he's, his arrogance absolutely destroyed him in these names. But I think he's learned his lesson and I think he's tarnished and I think he's finished. Mm -hmm. I think, I think a lot of people, namely Citadel and, and SAC or 0.72 or whatever he calls himself, New York Mets asset management. I think those guys all had a hand in, in that trade. The fact that Citadel is now trying to take its money from Melvin, you know, redeem some of it at the end of September really tells you all you need to know. They had to give him that money at the time. Otherwise, Melvin would have gone out of business. And if Melvin would have gone out of business, the knock on effect to it, in my mind, would have been horrific. It would have been good to see because it would have been good to see these clowns finally go out of business because they shouldn't be in business. But it's it's uh, they wanted to prevent a crisis. So that's what they did. Mm -hmm. So they've been stealing so much. This organized crime has been making them so much money. They got out over their skis and they were going to blow up and they were going to be out. And finally, they were going to lose. And they just they just said, well, we're going to make it a completely unfair game and just completely screw the people that beat us. And they did. And it's a total crime, a total crime. Now, here is uh, Robert Shapiro, hopefully giving us a little bit of uh, hope. He's a, he knows he's a, a former administration, administration official of something or other. I can't remember off the top of my head. But he knows Gary Gensler. He's optimistic. Chair Gary Gensler said in London recently, um, I think we can bring more transparency to short selling. We have unused authorities in that space that were granted by Congress nearly a dozen years ago. So based on everything you have said here and what you know, what should Gary Gensler be doing now? Well, let me say first, um, I know Gary quite well. Um, we were when I was under Secretary of Commerce, he was under Secretary of the Treasury, uh, and he's a he's a person of great integrity, someone I think who really is committed to protecting investors, regular investors. Um, and um, the first thing he can he can do, the most important thing he could do, is start referring cases of stock manipulation through you through short sales to the justice department for criminal prosecution uh you know the 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 fines are so i'll stop it there but he, he says that the people at the highest level have no fear of anything and the the, the it, the best thing Gary Gensler can do because the SEC is a civil organization. They can find people. They can't send them. Can't they? Can't have real uh, criminal penalties. So referring them to DOJ. And then since Gary Gensler came on, we saw that report from Bloomberg that uh, DOJ requested uh, the documents from SEC twice, I think, and because to go after these elite abusive short sellers. So Robert Gensler, I'm still so cynical about the government, but maybe Gensler will be will be a, a big help for us. Who knows? That'd be really really great. That would be really, really great. Ooh, let's bring up the stock. Although, do I dare? Okay, it's up a little. Good. That's such a wild ride lately. Such a wild ride lately. So, let's see if we can get the chart up there a little bit better. And that is the whole chart. Okay. And with that, and with that, my attendees, friendies, let's go to the phones. Remember, uh, Lucy Comisar will be here tomorrow. So uh, I'm going to, she's pretty excited. I, I've heard from a few times over email now. She's pretty excited. She wants to have a really good uh, specific conversation digging in. And so uh, though she's got me ex uh, I've reinvigorated. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to email her today with, with a great list of questions. So I've been digging into her stuff, very, uh, just, just, just terrific stuff. So I want to get her interested in, uh, in cassava. Uh, and, and, you know, and, and she's been, she's been working on this a long time. Maybe she's interested in the Alzheimer's angle, who knows? And, uh, uh, so please help. If you have questions, please help. Uh, if, if you, if you think of questions for her, or anything, there's interest, uh, send questions along. Also, we heard all those names, 0.72 QCM. Sorry, I'll put the stock back up. QCM 0.72, uh, 
uh, Citadel, uh, Stevie Cohen, SAC, <laughs> uh, New York Mets, whatever they called, he said. Uh, so that, that was just very, that was just really, really interesting. So I, I, so we, we, those are, that just plays into Saba. So it'll be, it'll, there's just all these natural ways. It seems like Saba's right at the center of everything that's happening now. So pretty obvious to us. Bernard, great to see you, my friend. How do you know that uh, banks make 75% off of shorting? Uh, Lucy said it was from Discovery from the Goldman Sachs case. Steve, uh, we need for Remy to go on the offensive. Enough is enough. Why is he passive? I'm thinking we need to do that, that, that preferred share dividend. That's something we can do. But Patrick Byrne eventually just said, you know what? I'm going to do this myself. And it worked uh, with, uh, beautifully. Perhaps Remy is joining the party via third party. We need Bernie Sanders on our side. I bet he's a fight we'll, we'll gladly take on. I hope so. Uh, all is forever crooked. Yeah, the blockchain is not those. So it's, it's, this stuff is so crooked. But the blockchain's not, so maybe it's so bad it'll drive people to the blockchain. 2022, what a surprise. Elder, okay. You gotta be kidding me. I gotta resize the, here we go. Eldar, all Remy needs to do is to focus on delivering the data. That's exactly what he's doing right now. Yeah, I, I'm, yeah, eventually, eventually, as we saw though, these shares never, ever, ever have to be uh, covered ever. <laughs> so until there's an event that may he makes some cover, I'm starting to think we do have to make an event because why is the share price doing what it's doing? We all know about these scams. The big and important question is what can be done to protect Saba against these attacks? Yeah. So the, that the dividend, the dividend. So I say is the dividend. So I'll get the good place for this. Uh, you like Marco Hodes? Well, Marco Hodes is interesting. So, like he said, he was so he was normally a short. So, you know, I don't know. So, yeah. So normally, I don't know, but he's against these abusive naked shortings. So, so, like we said, there's no. I'm not not that I'm calling Marco Hodes a thief, but there's no honor among thieves. Their side. I mean, how quickly did Goldman turn on him? And there's a, there's a lot of ugliness on their side, and and even the shorts are against those guys. Illegal pays. Yep. Clueless why people think SEC regulates these crooks when the SEC endorses this behavior, but hopefully Gensler. So that like that guy Mark Shapiro, former Secretary of Commerce, he was he's very like his eyes are wide open. Uh, he's he's very very against this stuff, and he likes Gary Gensler. So he's that that gave me optimism, and he 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 wants them to, he wants Gensler to prosecute the higher ups at these organized criminal syndicates, but they're so powerful they they control. The banks basically, Citadel, they control, they give so much money. You saw the, their fingers in everything. So they, they get away with everything. They pay everybody off. Wayne, great to see you, my friend. Mark, Mark became a member. Thank you, my friend. I set the membership up. Mark, uh, please make some noise if you didn't get what you need. Uh, I want to, uh, I've got, I wrote, I wrote the book, uh, The Ten Deez Commandments, How to a Guide to Crush the Market. You can become a member on the site here. It's $2.99 a month and then you get the book. And you can support the channel. And then you can also become a member for nine, I think it's nine bucks or nine ninety nine or eight ninety nine, whatever it is. Uh, and then you get the get the book and the Discord. But I'm still trying to set it up. Uh, I'm still trying to set it up. So if you if you did that and you didn't get what you what you needed, uh, tell me and, and I'll I'll just manually do it. As the stock sinks, as they create shares, probably. Uh, let's take a look at the broader market as well. Oh gosh, on, a, on an up day. Ooh, and heavy case down too. Oh, now it up. So choppy, choppiness. Well, it's early. You know what? You know it's early. I don't know why I'm being negative. Look at that. Look at that drop for Saba. Dramatic. But as we've seen, dramatic drops in the in the first 30 minutes or sometimes lead the buying. We have those options expiring tomorrow though. We'll see what happens. We have those options expiring tomorrow. We'll see what happens. Insider trading, nothing to see for yeah, Pelosi and, and, and the, yeah. Tell us what you really think. Yeah. 
Sandy, I hope Remy knows what he's dealing with. Total corruption. Issue the preferred stock. Sandy, I'm completely with you. It will. I think right now we're being phantom shares being created because those options, they don't want them to expire in the money. Frankly, I don't know what's going to happen between now and tomorrow at four. We'll see what happens in general. But tomorrow at 359 could be like an incredible time to buy maybe. I don't know. Hi, Joe. So what makes us think that the same would not happen with Saba? That is when the sheet hits the fan. They don't shut off buying and let only selling happen. We are under mess, underestimating enemies. I, I wouldn't doubt it at all. I wouldn't doubt I mean, if it came to it, they would. I mean, then, because they can get away with it. But they can't do the, the, this. That's what I'm saying. The, the, so they, they, they would do that. And then, uh, but still, then they, and they can short the crap out of it. But still, we can issue that preferred dividend, and then they're screwed, and they have to cover, and they're all going to have to cover at the same time, and it's going to squeeze them. And like Mark Shapiro, the former Secretary of Commerce, says, he went to the SEC and said, put these rules in. It'll squeeze these guys, and, and it'll, that's how the market punishes this stuff. That's how the market regulates this stuff. Market corrects itself. And they said, oh, no, 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 no. We don't want to have a squeeze. Well, you don't need the SEC's permission to put the rules in. If they're not going to put the rules in, issue the dividend. Issue the preferred share dividend. What happened during the Saba trade stop when it's when it dropped significantly? Uh, good question. Correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't Marco Hodes one of the big haters? I, I just he just tweeted happy. For, oh God, I'm I'm so I'm, I'm, I'm sorry about. It. Yeah, so like I said, I don't know what if that's his if he's trying to short Saba. Well, it's not a, it's obviously not a total scam. Anyway, that was an interview from a long time, from a, like September anyway. So I don't know if maybe, so maybe he was short it and, and maybe made some money. Anyway, that doesn't, that's not, a, that doesn't really matter. That it, the, he was a hedge fund manager that then got screwed by these prime brokers and he let us know what the prime brokers are doing. So, so yeah, thank you for that, Eldar. Thank you for that, uh, for that color. And frankly, I didn't, when I, when I was listening, I didn't know that, but it does, that doesn't really matter. But his comments, his, that was, that was a while ago. And that's where his commentary on Citadel was incredibly valuable. And like we said, he was short overstock and then they became friends with Patrick Byrne. And then you know what he did? He went long and he made a lot of money. He probably was in with Patrick Byrne telling him to do that dividend. So we'll get Cahodes on our side. Patrick Byrne got him on us. So he was short overstock, changed his mind and went long. He was okay. He's short Saba. Let's make it our goal. We'll change his mind and get him on our side and go long. Was the stock manipulation used in conjunction with Bix news? Yeah, I, I do believe so. I don't think anyone on the planet cares about Bic. And when it comes to Bic, well, we got we should just keep asking her about that insurance fraud where she used to work. What did she have to do with that insurance fraud? Why won't she talk about that insurance fraud? We're going to talk about fraud. Why won't she talk about the insurance fraud? But yeah, I don't think. I think again, just just they'll they'll put out their tweet or whatever to pretend that's what's moving, it, and then they'll move it, creating these phantom shares. Kareem, great video again. And honestly, you opened my stock knowledge up so much that it goes beyond Saba. Thank you, my friend. This is all opening my eyes too. I'm learning all, all this as well. I didn't I didn't know a lot of this. This is this is aggravating stuff. I didn't know a lot of this. The education part of your videos are the best. Thank you, my friend. Please keep doing what you're doing. Thank you very much. I, that, that, that is my favorite. I, I have like 15 years in the classroom. And this 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 is what I'm doing. So if, if people ever say that I, I've, I've sort of uh, seem like I've got some experience, whatever, doing this. It, it's from being in the classroom, and that's what I like doing is, is teaching. So the best when these videos are the best. It's I have it's I find something valuable that I just learned and I'm excited about, and I turn around and share it with everybody. And then and I, I feel like that will make a like, really great video too. So thank you for saying so, Kareem. I, that, that's that's the, the the best videos are are exactly that. So thank you. I'll try to do it more. Tomorrow's uh, live is at noon or at, or at nine. Now I think it's noon, so let's say noon. But I'll 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 go back and confirm. And after after this, I'll create the uh, the stream invitation thing and I'll tweet it out. So uh, I think it's I think it's noon because I think when we confirmed we were still doing noon every day. So a question to Lucy. Okay, thank you, Dana. What are those heartless shorts scared about? If not the Department of Justice or SEC? Well, so that's that was Shapiro's point. Is they're not they they have no fear of God, obviously. And so we need to put the fear of the law into them. And so perhaps uh, Gary Gensler, and perhaps we can both be helpful, but perhaps we can just be helpful to Gary Gensler and, and just and put a spotlight on everything good that he does, encourage him to do more good and, and, just, and, and keep encouraging him to do more good. And, 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 and so I, I, I want to talk to, uh, to Shapiro. Uh, and so hopefully uh, that would be great to get the former Secretary of Commerce on here to talk about this because he's aggressive. I really liked it. And... Uh, and and like I said, I want to well, let's turn Marco Hodes. If he was short, he was short overstock. Turned around, made a lot of money on it. So let's turn him around, make a lot of money on Sava Long. 
So uh, what are these heartless scared about, if not the Department of Justice? So that, that, that's a great question, Dana, That because that, that's what this all drives to. It's OK, we're we're we're, we're with you, Lucy, about all this, like the, the regulatory capture and about the organized crime. So what do we do? So what are those heartless shorts scared about, if not justice or SEC? So good question. Now, I think the preferred dividend is also a, a, an answer there. We can issue that preferred dividend and they have they'll have to cover because those phantom shares uh, are all going to everybody that bought a phantom share is going to say, where's my preferred shares that don't exist? And so they're, they're going to say, "Uh oh, these preferred shares don't exist. These, these shares don't exist. So when the preferred shares that are on the blockchain that we can't fake when it's time to create those, which we can't fake with this phantom options crap, they're not going to be able to, to come up with preferred shares. Therefore, they're going to have to cover before the preferred shares are, are issued. So when when Cassava announces, here's the X dividend date for a preferred share dividend, they're going to cover between then and, and then between the time they announce it and that that uh, X dividend date. Gensler's not going to do anything. Remy will have to take action. Let's do let's do two pronged attack. Let's let's try let's try to get uh, help get help from Gary Gensler. And let's uh, let's try to get uh, Remy to just take matters into his own hands. Oh, also, uh, two things. While well, I'm thinking of, I wanted to. Uh, <laughs> I've the the uh, pound sign free Remy. I, I saw uh, I, I saw something yesterday. It was a pound sign free something. I thought it was funny. Uh, I think it was like a. <laughs> I know what it was on LinkedIn. There was the old movie Tommy Boy, and LinkedIn did did some funny promo making a LinkedIn uh, uh, profile. For Tommy Call Tommy R. Callahan the uh, Third, Vice President at, at Callahan Auto Parts in Sandusky, Ohio, if you remember the movie, and that was really funny. Uh, so, uh, so uh, that and then and then there's uh, before I forget this trivia. I wanted to start doing trivia. So uh, if 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 uh, we want to start doing uh, like I think maybe in the afternoons we'll start doing a regular trivia game. I thought that'd be really f a really fun thing for us all to do. Also an educational thing too. We can all learn. So maybe I'll find some interesting facts. And that can be sort of a quick way to do that. And then uh, let's just keep moving because I can't remember the other thing about the LinkedIn thing. It'll come to me. Gensler's not going to do anything. Remember, we have to take action. Smithlem needs to be approved via accelerated approval or breakthrough therapy designation. The president needs this drug. So many people in our society that are higher, that are significant people are moving into the age bracket where they're going to need this drug. So, it, I mean, there's so many... Pretty soon, there's, there's going to be a lot of people getting scared. Like, uh oh, I want this drug for me or for my family. So, letting letting spreading the, the good word uh, is 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 going to be big. Still trying to think, what was I going to what was I going to say when I was talking about LinkedIn? Oh, oh, free Remy, free Remy, free Remy. So, and on that LinkedIn, when LinkedIn did that, they did free Tommy Boy. It was the hashtag. I thought that was funny. So I, th I think for the tweets we could start doing a free Remy thing. <laughs> just as a this guy thought that was, I just thought it was funny. Or we could do free uh, Dr. Wang. We do free Wang. <laughs> that might that might be that might be a little more viral. Free Wang. <laughs> that might. What do you guys think about that? Because it's a little bit you know it's a little bit risque, but it's not too bad, and it would be viral. And it's like it's a real thing. Free Wang because it's like you know because he's 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 being pilloried. The guy found the cure basically for Alzheimer's basically you know he found the first disease modifying treatment for Alzheimer's probably and uh, he's been getting he's getting killed for it so free wang what do you guys think about free wang <laughs> similar uh Smithland needs to be uh, uh yes I agree so BTD yeah I agreed BTD big time agreed that's another thing that Remy can get more aggressive on perhaps we can encourage him or ask him about that and now again now then uh, we should say because remember they had the meeting with Robert Temple, so I believe that they did press for it, and I believe that that, uh, that they're they're doing what they can with the FDA being the way that they are. So I don't I don't want to give Mister Barbier any 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 uh, negativity on that though. Uh, so they can they can create those shares all they want. They can, uh, the, there's a fee that that anybody that wants to bet against Sava can pay Citadel or these prime brokers to create shares. The market makers can do it. So if they want to pay a fee, they can drive us down as much as they want. What can we do about it? We can issue that preferred share, the preferred share dividend. That's what we can do. It will totally screw them. They'll, it'll squeeze them and they'll be totally screwed. 
Dana. Hi, everyone. Please like this video. Less than half of us have done so. YouTube loves likes by uh, by live audience. Oh, thanks so much, Dana. Yes, please hit like. Uh, that, that, that's a great point. Please hit like. Uh, we're trying to spread the word. Uh, so so please uh, hit like to, to spread the word. Yeah, that's something you can do if, if, if you want to support the channel and, and uh, hit, hit the like button, please. Hey, Joe, what's going on? Why the sudden dump? Sir, I, I'm sure that it was an, I'm sure that it was an attack. And they're trying to manipulate the market to make those as many of those options expire worthless tomorrow as they can is what I think. With the market makers in their pocket, paying them paying an exorbitant fee to do it. What can we do? Issue that preferred share dividend. Would the institutional investors be interested in preferred dividend? If not, I think it's a dead end. We are just small fish in the sea. Well, maybe. I don't know. We've, maybe we have Mr. Barbier's attention. If he's interested in it, I think that's the most important thing. He and he and Eric and 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 the board. If they're interested, if, if they get upset enough by these shorts, I mean, they've lost a lot of money too, so... Uh, if they get enough, if they get upset enough, Rainer hoped the chapter Dr. Bick has been closed. Now she's spreading FUD again. Very surprising for me. I, like I said, I don't know this, but I think that those people are on the payroll and it doesn't matter how wrong they are. They still get paid every month. So I don't know that, but we saw that in other cases that people were getting about a hundred thousand dollars a year. They were getting cards that they go to the ATM and just get cash out. So it was never linked to their own bank account. There was no record. They could just go get cash. So why would they stop spreading? Uh, th I mean, they're both, it's just, they, they go for the most nonsense FUD because that's all they have. There's no good, all of the facts are on our side. So what can they do except have nonsense? Sava short borrow fee rate up to 1541 now. How can shorts keep selling the stock? Yeah, ridiculous. Ridic so, I mean, so that's, so the, what a moneymaker. Because remember, the prime brokers are not, the market makers are not, actually getting the shares. They're just creating the synthetic shares in the options market. And so, and then charging an exorbitant fee. So if, if somebody wants to, they can short this without, without any available shares if they want to. All the more hard they're going to get screwed if, they, if, if Mr. Barbier issues that preferred share dividend. Price-wise, we're getting tight team. Not av available to short on Webull anymore. Was charging 20% yesterday. It means they can't get any. 20%, so 15%, 20%, and now you can't even get it. And then we know these market makers will, will just create them anyway. It means they can't get any. At least that's what I was told last time I got short. Regardless of what the shorts do, they can't change the peer-reviewed data or the phase three results. True, but it, and so from that respect, that's true. Although they can try to interfere with the trials, which they will. They've already interfered with data once. So, and they're trying to stop the trials now. <laughs> so they're actually trying to, they're trying to stop data from being created. And after it is created, they're trying to change the analysis of it. So, which they've already done. So <laughs> there's really nothing they won't do as we've seen. But so free Wang, I'll start putting. What, 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 we got nobody. Uh, nobody. So Dr. Wang is is you know pop on in line to get the Nobel Prize, uh, and uh, he's he's coming under attack. So when we tweet about stuff like that, a, a hashtag of free Wang could get some attention, perhaps. No, I mean that's a low hanging fruit, right? I mean that's <laughs> it's right there for the taking. Yes, no one no one has an opinion. I thought that would be. I must not know YouTube. I must not know my audience at all. My audience must be highly intellectual and not nearly as a uh, uh, juvenile in their sense of humor as myself. <laughs> well, let's see. IKT about the same. Hey, Q's having a big old day. My goodness. How about the spies? The broader market up. Weeble drives me crazy. If I type too fast, I type spy too fast, I type SPY, I see it say SP, and then the P goes away and it changes the P to a Y. I've never seen a never seen a program do that before. So the broader market is up, but the options are expiring tomorrow tomorrow. So who knows? Tomorrow, tomorrow at uh 350 could be a really great time to buy. 355. 
And then we get great catalysts. And then Mr. Barbier says, you know what? Screw these shorts. I'm issuing, I'm taking matters in my own hands, issuing that preferred dividend. Then things would be a lot different. I hate to say that because Sava ain't a meme stock, but you need Wall Street bets. Yeah, that's the other thing about this channel is people say, don't stop your nonsense, which I see on one hand. Uh, but it's like it's it's a fine line between trying to make people watch and having content. <laughs> Sava, yeah, Sava could be the next GameStop with almost 40% short. And as we saw Wes Christian say, the reported short interest is, in his words, garbage. It's about 50 to 150% higher on his in his average client. So we're not about 40% short interest. We're about 80% short interest, maybe higher. Maybe higher. Well, okay, so I really appreciate you guys uh, coming up with the, the, the questions for Lucy. Uh, we'll, uh, I'm really looking forward to, to, to speaking with her. Uh, so I'm going to uh, do some more preparation for that. Let's hope the stock recovers, but options expire tomorrow. So we should get some, should be, uh, should be, should be some relief coming. And then all the great catalysts and hopefully the preferred share dividend and, uh, and everything else. So uh, great to see you. Uh, we'll be back at three o'clock for another one. I'll send the tweet about, I think the noon, I think it's noon tomorrow for Lucy. So I'll, I'll send that out and uh, I will see you guys then. So see you guys at three o'clock for another one. Uh, thanks a lot. See you then. Nilos, thank you, my friend. Thank you. Uh, see ya.